to the patient. And now, now with proton therapy um, being available in Kansas City, we need to understand how that works. So we have three objectives for this program. First, we want to increase your knowledge of radiation therapy for the treatment of cancer in general. Second, we'd like to increase your knowledge of the side effects that a patient might experience from radiation therapy. And this can include proton therapy as well as part of that. And then third, we'd like to help you understand the role of patient research advocates, the role we play in research partnerships that involve proton therapy. So today we are delighted to have Darren Kistler and he is the senior, he is the senior director of radiation services at the KU Cancer Center. Darren has over 35 years of experience in various roles around radiation services. So he's going to be a great, um, excellent resource for us to ask our questions and um, learn about uh, radiation and proton therapy on this call. So we'll start off, he will share a presentation on proton therapy, and then we'll have time for questions. So as we go through this, if you think of questions, be sure to put your questions in the chat and um, Tracy will be monitoring those and um, accumulating those and then we will answer them at the end. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Darren. Welcome, Darren. Thank you, Kathy. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, I'll, I'll first off, I'll start off with to say that um, I've not shaved or had a haircut since the end of December because I'm a shavee for the American Cancer Society on May 12th. And so this is not my normal appearance. You don't know me, so you wouldn't know that, but uh, I've never had facial hair in my life. And I'm like, every four weeks I get a haircut and it's very, very short. So you're seeing me at my worst um, from that standpoint. So my, um, I, I wanna tell you a little bit about proton therapy. I wanna tell you about, um, um, so you just maybe have some of the talking points that we'd need of how it's different. Um, we are very excited to be able to bring this service to the University of Kansas and the patients we serve. And so um, I'm going to jump right into it. So one of the first things we're going to talk about is what is proton therapy and how is it different? So you'll hear me use the word photon and proton. Photon is x-rays. Photon is what we typically think of when we think about external beam radiation. And proton is a particle. And the particle, the proton particle, has some very unique properties that, that aids us in preventing side effects and getting more dose to the tumor. So the University of Kansas is the 39th proton center in the nation. And so when you look at this map, you see a couple of glaring things. One is there's an absence of proton centers in the Midwest and upper Midwest. And you see most proton centers are on the East Coast. Um, but if the, the original proton center was actually at Loma Linda, California, it opened in the 90s. So proton therapy as a modality is not new. Um, but one of the things I want to cover today is there's been a lot of technologic, technological changes that happen with proton therapy. And so we've seen a lot more proton centers open in the last five to seven years um, based upon some of these technology shifts. There are currently proton centers. There, there's about 12 proton centers that I'm aware of that have either opened since we did last year or are in development or under construction right now. So this number will continue to grow. Um, Arkansas has a unit um, that will open up later this year. And there's a second proton therapy unit opening in the Kansas City region, which is under a very, very different model. So, um, you know, this is great news for our patients. Um, proton therapy is very much of a regional service and we'll kind of talk about that. Uh, at this point in time, we've treated patients from five different states. So uh, many patients are coming into the area that typically would not have necessarily sought out care at the University of Kansas. So I know one of the passions I have is the ability. Um, I think proton, because of the low number of 
every patient that receives proton therapy should be under a clinical trial. And so when we opened, um, we felt very we felt very strongly about that. And so I think we're in the upper 90% of our patients are on a clinical trial. Now these are at this point in time, these are um, these trials are more registry trials, but we've partnered with a, the Proton Collaborative Group to open up some additional treatment trials. There are some national trials that are out there that compare photon and proton that we're part of, but um, you know, we feel like as an academic medical center, uh, part of our commitment is that we're designing the care for the future and the care for the future, we believe clinical trials are at the heart of that, as well as being a teaching and training uh, university. From day one, the whole thought about proton therapy was always centered around our patients. Um, you know, with our partnership with Children's Mercy, um, it's often that our patients um, that, that re needed proton therapy were being sent um, to an area outside of Kansas City. And you can kind of think about the, um, the hardship on a family to have to move out of where their home is for anywhere from two to three months uh, whilst um, a loved one could receive treatment. So uh, being able to offer a better treatment closer to home was all, has always been part of our mission. But when we think about an academic medical center um, and, and an NCI comprehensive designated cancer center, you know, proton is one of those core types of treatments that we need to have um, you know, in our program. And as I mentioned before, this is very much of a regional service. Um, patients are traveling um, from, from across Kansas and Missouri predominantly, but we've also treated patients from Arkansas, I think South Carolina, uh, Iowa, and Nebraska for this. Um, if we go back to the basics of cancer therapy, um, we typically try to lump um, types of treatments into three large buckets. So surgery, which I think you all are very familiar with, is a very local treatment. So taking out where the tumor is and maybe um, immediate, um, maybe lymph nodes that have cancer in them, but a very much of a surgical uh, local treatment. And radiation is the same. So side effects, um, radiation impact, um, cell kill is all based upon the area that receives the radiation beam. And, and proton is just another form of radiation. And then we think about systemic therapies, which are like chemotherapy or immunotherapy. They are whole body treatments. So um, that you know, would be used to treat areas outside of where the primary tumor is um, to receive this. So here again, Proton is another form of radiation therapy, uh, well-established treatment methodology in the kind of the three legs of the stool around cancer care. So one of the most common questions I get asked is, is you know, what types of treatments are done with proton therapy? And pediatrics will always be at the top of the list. And, and the reason why is, is if you think about the earliest proton centers, um, most of those uh, facilities did treated a lot of pediatrics. So there are long-term side effects around radiation. And so the concern for a side effect that may have manifest 40 years from treatment is not as much of a concern in an 80-year-old as there is a four-year-old. So if a four-year-old that's treated with radiation, those long-term side effects could be pretty detrimental because of the long stage of their life. But just the tolerance for side effects and the, the risk of damage of developing organs, um, bones in pediatrics is much more severe. So we need to make sure that um, dose reduction is, is the number one factor. But virtually you could say that proton could be used on any area of the body. And so, um, some of these in this top four or five list are the areas that we would be focusing on, tumors of the spine, tumors of the head and neck, tumors of the brain, um, and tumors that in, involving um, the spinal cord. 
but other areas are certainly um, at different stages of development and under clinical trial. So you might say, how is proton different than traditional forms of radiation therapy? And so if you don't remember anything else from my talk today, it's really about a dose reduction. And it, in fact, it's about a 50% dose reduction to normal tissue. Um, that's achieved by several ways. One is there's less entrance dose. So the, the distance from the skin to where the tumor starts, it's that range, that's the entrance dose. And so uh, there is a spike of radiation that happens with a proton beam. That spike is placed inside the tumor and the radiation stops. It doesn't come out the body. So when we think of traditional X-ray therapy and you think about if you went and got a chest exam or a chest X-ray, the image is based upon the radiation that exits the patient's body and hits a detector. With proton beam, there is no exit of radiation. So when you add up the less entrance dose, there is no exit dose. And the fact that it delivers most of its dose inside the tumor, that's where we get the significant reduction of dose to healthy tissue. And you can't really give a talk about uh, physics and radiation without looking at some crazy medical graphs. And so I, th I think that's important. So the way I describe this and try to um, let you visualize it is if you think of an avocado. And in avocado, there's a seed in the middle. The seed represents the tumor. And so we want to make sure that the, any of the, the healthy avocado is not getting much radiation dose, but we're giving all of our dose or as much as possible in the seed. And if you see this spike of radiation, they place that spike of radiation inside that seed. So the surrounding tissue is not getting the radiation um, or at least minimize radiation compared to where um, the, the tumor versus the normal structures. What happens in the treatment planning process, and you kind of see with a couple of pictures here is, is that the patient starts their planning process with a CAT scan, and they're able to do a three-dimensional mapping of that tumor. And the way that the radiation works is it's kind of like a laser printer. So once they have a model or a three-dimensional model of that tumor, they plug that into the treatment delivery system, and it basically treats the exact same shape as the model that they've given it. So it's very, very sophisticated from that standpoint. Um, but I always say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so I think visually you'll be able to see kind of some of the key differences uh, between photon and proton radiation. So this first case here, um, just to kind of set the stage. So we use colors in radiation to depict different levels of dose. And so the reds in this example are the highest level of dose. And then we get into the, the blues and the greens, yellows are lower dose. And so for medulloblastoma, which is one of the more common pediatric malignancies, um, the, the, the treatment that the physician's trying to deliver is is all of the CNS system, the brain and the spinal cord. In essence, any place there's cerebrospinal fluid. And you see on the right with the proton, they're able to shape that dose very, very succinctly to the target zone. And so if you look on the left with photon irradiation, you start to see dose represented in places outside the target. So you see the reds, show where the target is, and you show all these other colors where they're not. But if you think about where this low dose is region, it's going into the patient's oral cavity, it's going down the patient's esophagus, it's going down the patient's lungs, the patient's heart, the patient's abdomen and upper pelvis. And that's all area that, that radiation is doing no benefit it's outside the target zone and doing nothing but giving the patient short and long-term side effects. So you see with the proton beam, um, they're able to deliver a, a much more targeted dose and this patient would have less side effects, both long-term and short-term. And this next example is a, is a 
as a patient that they're boosting a tumor inside the brain. And I think just from graphically, when you look at color represents dose, you can see that on the right with the proton beam, there's significantly less volume of normal brain tissue that's receiving radiation. The red is the target zone in both depictions, but you look at all these other areas within the patient's cranial contents that are receiving radiation. Here's another case of a patient with a brain tumor. You see the target zone over here on the right, which is the red, compared to the IMRT or the X-ray on the left, and you start to see this normal tissue outside the target zone that's receiving, albeit low doses of radiation, it's radiation that's not benefiting the patient's treatment. Patient with head and neck cancer, a similar type of example, you see that high dose regions, very confined, very conformal on the right. On the left, you see a much larger area or volume of tissue that's receiving radiation. The head and neck area is very sensitive. You think about patients able to eat, swallow, have saliva are all based out of the head and neck region. And so much more of that tissue, normal tissues are radiated on the left. Um, I mentioned that, you know, the original proton unit in Loma Linda was opened in the 1990s. The technology then is very, very different. And so you might say, what changed? Well, the first thing that changed was the invention of the, what we're calling pencil beam. And so pencil beam is um, the radiation, instead of coming out in kind of a shotgun approach, it comes out in a very thin um, beam. And so that beam, once they've made a three-dimensional model of the tumor, then it treats by layers. So it, it takes a tumor, any shape that has been determined, um, and it breaks it down into a whole bunch of layers and a whole bunch of points within it. And then it gives dose to each of those points. Um, the other thing that, that really changed was the size of a proton unit. Um, the earliest proton centers were roughly the size of a football field. Um, so they were very, very large. And so thus not only being very large, they were also very, very expensive. And so about 10 years ago, the compact unit became somewhat of a reality. And even though we say compact, it's still relatively large, but it's not the size of a football field. It's, it's a much smaller footprint. So our facility, um, everything that we tried to do um, from day one was think about the patient experience. Um, so as, as one of the leading indications for proton therapy as pediatrics, we wanted to try to create an environment um, conducive for pediatrics, but it also serves an adult population. Um, so we tried to bring a little art and, a little, and, and, and a, I guess an, a, an atmosphere that was a little bit more soothing for the patient. So a couple of the things that we did was um, there's the whole side of the gantry, which is about 50 feet long, is what we call the feature wall. Um, and it's backlit by LEDs and we can change the color of it. So the color that the staff have a great time to determining what color the wall will be today. You see in this picture, it's kind of a, a blue and a white, but it's usually um, a pink or a green or a blue. And a lot of times we associate that with um, the cancer month, if it's uh, depending on um, if it's breast cancer or prostate cancer for that month. And then the other kind of unique part of this is called the Philips ambient lighting experience. And so um, there's an interactive touch screen display and so when the patient enters the room, they get to select their theme. And when they select their theme, the video on the end of the wall changes to that theme. All of the lighting changes to that theme. And then there's a musical piece to this as well. So for our kids, we often have three or four loaded that are more kid friendly. And I always say, if it's my wife of 30 years, she's gonna pick the beach theme the lights turn to aquamarine, and then you hear the crashing of waves. Um, but the patient gets a little bit of control in that situation and what I would deem somewhat of an uncontrollable situation. So um, the proton unit, I said, it's called a compact. Um, and I say it's compact. I take that with a grain of salt. 
The gantry itself is three stories tall. It weighs over a hundred tons and it rotates around the patient with a very small, um, within sub-millimeter accuracy. If you look at this upper picture, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's one little section in here called the treatment room. So when you think about this large structure, the patient's only in one very, very small piece of this and the machine rotates around it. It's three stories tall. So it takes a story above and a story below to rotate around the patient. And in the very back of the unit, there's something called the cyclotron. That's where the proton beam is, is generated. And that cyclotron is uh, somewhere around 55 tons. The company itself is Belgium based. So um, it's if I need a part, um, it's a whole lot easier to go upstairs and get a part than it is to get it shipped from Belgium. So we have a parts depot you know, that's right there on site. Um, so most common parts that would ever fail with the proton unit um, are on site. Um, the way my arrangement works with IBA is, is I get the machine for about 16 hours a day. They get the machine for eight hours a day. So they work, they are there 24 hours, seven days a week. They get the machine on the nights and on the weekends to keep up with maintenance. So certainly our goal would be as we minimize the amount of impact to the patients um, and try to keep that unit running all the time. So if they've got service to do, they do it typically after hours. If we had any construction people, you would be a um, pretty incredible feat of engineering to, uh, to, to build a proton center. Um, there's uh, 2000 cubic yards of concrete. Uh, I think that's, I, I can't remember the exact, but that's several hundred um, concrete trucks just in itself. I, I think it's 200, there's about 10, yards of concrete on a concrete truck that you see driving on the highway. So that's 234 different concrete trucks to provide the shielding for the, the proton therapy unit. Um, I always come back to the patient story. Um, so Lisa Webb was our first adult patient that received proton therapy. Some of you may have um, saw her story. Some she was um, some of our internal marketing efforts um, and some of our social media efforts around uh, proton therapy. Lisa was faced with the decision to leave the Kansas City area for uh, her proton therapy, um, and so she was able to receive all that care right here um, as an outpatient basis, driving from her home in Overland Park each day uh, versus picking up and moving. Um, to the next closest facility, which would have been um, Oklahoma City or St. Louis or flying to a different city to receive her care. And she received all of it here um, and, and has been a really a great advocate for proton therapy um, for our program. Um, much of what I've talked about today has been more about the technology of proton therapy and, and the the proton particle superiority over the photon, but it's really much more in depth than that. We were able to recruit um, just a nationally recognized team to operate the proton center um, that brought this level of expertise so that when we treated our first patient, we had great confidence that the treatment was being delivered um, it perfectly exactly the way it was planned. But also, you know, the compassion around, um, you know, getting patients through a course of treatment um, it is difficult. And so the compassion that they bring, I think, really is what truly makes a difference. I'd like to highlight a couple of the people on this slide. So Dr. Ron Chin, upper right hand corner, um, grew up in Topeka, Kansas, um, received all of his medical training at Harvard. And, um, and we got the chance for him to, I guess I say, come home uh, back to the Kansas City region. And, and as our chair of radiation oncology, um, it's, it's just a, a complete um, a gift for us. He is he's just incredible. On the upper left-hand corner is Eutine Lynn, Dr. Lynn, and she is our chief of proton physics. 
Um, and so she's also Harvard trained, um, but just um, one of the true stars um, in the nation and world around proton therapy. And we were able to re recruit her to our program. Uh, right below her and that's over left is Dr. Ronnie Rotondo. He is our medical director for proton therapy. Um, and he is also our pediatric radiation oncologist. So uh, many of the patients that we provide service to in proton are pediatrics and Dr. Rotondo has been instrumental in that. Uh, but truly the people part of this are very, very important. Um, oftentimes patients, when they're diagnosed with, a, with cancer and they hear that they need radiation, they don't know if proton therapy um, is right for them. So we have a really great program through our navigation department um, for patients that are interested in proton therapy, learning more about that. Uh, they go through our nurse navigation program. This is Sarah in the photo. She primarily handles our pediatric um, navigation into, for radiation oncology. Um, but oftentimes patients, either local or from a regional standpoint, would like their case review, would like to meet with one of our physicians to see if proton therapy was the, the, the correct treatment. And oftentimes, you know, as an academic medical center, um, they learn about other forms of therapy we offer that may not be available in a community hospital setting that, they're, that they've been in. So oftentimes these patients actually continue to stay here at Kansas City, at the University of Kansas Cancer Center to receive their treatment. And they may have asked about proton, but there may be another form of therapy that was more appropriate for their diagnosis. So we opened our proton therapy center um, May 23rd of uh, 2022. So we are coming up on our one year anniversary next month. Um, so I pulled these data slides from the end of March. And at that point in time, we treated 148 patients um, from five different states. Um, that number will be a lot higher in our second year of operation because really for the first six months, we, um, as we were bringing our team together, um, we did a lot of things to limit how many patients that we could um, address on the proton unit. And so our goal is that we're offer, operating about anywhere from 12 to 15 hours per day in the proton vault. So um, at first we just started out with eight hour shifts and now we're expanding to a longer. And right now we're treating um, on average 23 to 25 patients per day with proton with probably a maximum capacity of around 30 patients per day. 35% of our patient travel greater than 50 miles. Um, so certainly signifying that proton therapy is much more of a tertiary service. Um, and when we think about the age of our patients, 16% um, were under age 18. Our youngest patient was 10 months old. Um, and then 26%, so about a fourth of our patients are under 30, um, 30 years of old. So, um, here again, part of that with radiation, it's not what you treat, it's what you don't treat. And so um, the younger our patient population is, the more of uh, lifespan that they have to receive side effects from radiation. So proton therapy is certainly targeted um, as a high indicator for patients that are younger in age. I am going to um, go over to a quick video here. And so I'll have to work out a couple of, I may have a couple of technical challenges here as I move over into this, um, just to make sure we can hear our sound. If someone can take off mute, just to make sure that you're able to hear the sound, that would be very helpful to me as I play this video. I can hear the sound. Yes. Welcome to the Proton Therapy Center, Kansas City's first proton center and the 39th proton center in the country. I'm Dr. Ronnie Rotondo, medical director of the Proton Therapy Center at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. And I'm Dr. Ronald Chen, chair of radiation oncology. Patients of our Proton Therapy Center receive top-of-the-line care from a team of proton experts unparalleled in the region. 
This includes nationally and internationally renowned radiation oncologists, medical physicists, and dosimetrists. These specialists, whom we've recruited from across the country, will create a customized treatment plan for each patient. Now, we want to take you inside our NCI Comprehensive Cancer Center's Proton Therapy Center. Here is Jessica Lovell to give you a tour. Hard at work inside the Proton Therapy Center is a pencil-thin beam of light, giving new hope to cancer patients across the region and beyond. Hello, I'm Jessica Lovell, and welcome to the University of Kansas Cancer Center. I'm standing in what I like to call the healing hallway that leads back to the Proton Treatment Room. This is where you'll come after you check in at the front desk. The dogwoods symbolize rebirth, but this wood frame is also symbolic. This curve right here, it's intentional. It represents the Bragg Peak of the Proton Beam the precise point where protons stop on a dime to deliver a prescribed dose of radiation to the tumor, but not beyond. So come along, there's much more to show you. These are the changing areas where you will wait for treatment. There's an area for men and women. Children wait in here too, but don't worry, they have plenty of ways to entertain themselves prior in a family waiting area with TV, animated games, floor art, and interactive programming they can take with them, even into treatment. Now, before I show you the treatment room, I want you to understand the prep work that happens first. All proton therapy patients go through a process called CT simulation and treatment planning in the radiation pavilion just down the hall. The CT scan provides imaging to precisely localize the tumor that will require proton therapy. Here, some patients may have a couple of tattoo dots placed on their body to indicate where the radiation beam will be directed. No worries about any other medical devices you might have. Your medical team knows what to consider, and that's all part of your personalized plan. Are you ready to see the vault? That's what we call the treatment room. Come with me. One of the first things you'll see is this video projection wall. Patients can select from 14 different scenic lighting and surround themes. There are calming scenes, as well as jungles, oceans, and even outer space. It's all customizable for children and adults. The room temperature is kept at 70 degrees. That's because the proton equipment produces a lot of heat. Notice the subdued lighting. There's Wi-Fi for music. You may bring your own playlists or podcasts too. The cyclotron that delivers the proton therapy is behind that locked door. The nozzle delivers the pencil thin beam of protons to the patient. The patient lays on the table. This is when the mask is positioned if you have one. Images are taken rotating 220 degrees as the treatment can be delivered from multiple angles and then the nozzle is set. The therapists then exit the treatment room and go to the console area to deliver the treatment. No worries, cameras and microphones mean the therapist can still see and hear you. Your tumor type determines the number of beams and the length of treatment. There is absolutely no pain from proton therapy. In fact, you can't even feel the proton beam at all. While treatment delivery takes just a few minutes, on average, it takes 30 minutes to position patients perfectly. There is anesthesia for children and adults who may need it. Once your treatment is done, you may leave, unless it's an exam day. Exams with your doctor happen every five treatments or more often as needed. Okay, there's just one more thing I wanna show you, and that's the proton therapy bell that sits across from the nursing station. When your treatments are done, you'll get to ring it, and we'll be right there celebrating with you. Remember, our medical team is a combination of highly skilled and nationally renowned proton therapy experts, available in the region only at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. And we thank you for trusting us with your cancer care. All right, I think I'm ready for questions. Okay, thank you, Darren. Um, we, we have a couple so far. Um, the, the first, you mentioned clinical trials, um, or most of the patients there are in clinical trials. 
you also mentioned the the age of these um, proton machines makes a difference in terms of their capabilities. How is that being looked at in terms of clinical trials? If if somebody's getting proton therapy on maybe this machine that's very new versus something that's older. Yeah, so a couple of the things. So one of the, when the technology shift happened, um, so, and I'll say, let's say 10 years ago, so proton therapy units that are 10 years or older probably do not have pencil beam. And so comparing the types of treatment they could do with the current treatment they, it would be very, very different. Um, so pencil beam allowed the number of indications for proton therapy to go up dramatically. Um, so the earlier proton treatment machines, um, they were unable to treat a lot of diagnoses. So when I think about in the last 10 years, there's a lot more proton therapy units. It's the two reasons. One, the size came down. When the size came down, the cost went down. So they makes it more affordable. And two is, is when they changed the technology to pencil beam, then they, what they allowed the number of indications of patients that could receive proton therapy went up. So more patients can receive it. Um, I, I would just say if I were to need radiation and need specifically need, you know, proton therapy, uh, my first question would be is, is pencil beam available? And I would only myself choose to be treated on a pencil beam machine because um, once again, it's, it's just, it's, it's a the much newer technology. Um, it, it's kind of like the thought of a 30 year old TV versus a new TV, just very, very different. Um, I don't know specifically about some of the current clinical trials. If they, um, if they, if it's an eligibility criteria to have pencil beam, um, but, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's just like radiation therapy today, thinking about treatment that was 30 years ago versus today, that sophistication is much higher. It probably wouldn't be a great comparison. Thanks. We have a question in terms of insurance coverage. Obviously, a lot of patients are, are covered by insurance. Is this considered standard of care or experimental? Um, how, how does it work in terms of coverage of, from most um, insurance carriers? So that's the most common question I get um, about cost and, and insurance. So I'll, I'll talk about a, a few different things. Um, so there are, and, and the way insurance changes is clinical trials. So as clinical trials looking at standard of care versus a new type of treatment, as they compare that and there's more data, then you know, that's what kind of moves the bar with insurance companies. Um, their diagnosis has been um, categorized into three major diagnostic categories. And so category one are patients like pediatrics, tumors of the eye, tumors of the base of skull um, that are in category one and pretty much universally every single insurance company will cover. Um, and then we have patients in category two and category three. In category two, it's, it depends. It depends on that specific payer. Um, in category two, um, we just need uh, more clinical data. So um, patients with um, maybe esophageal cancer or breast cancer, you know, there's strong indications for that, but it does depend upon the payer. And then category three is really tough to get paid. Um, and so the way that our physicians handle category and category, category two and category three is a lot of times on a case by case basis, they will do a comparison of photon or traditional x-ray compared to proton and show if they can demonstrate that there's a meaningful difference in the treatment based upon uh, the area that's being irradiated or um, and, and oftentimes this is being used for patients that have already received radiation and with proton, they need, they need additional treatment. So maybe they can uh, reduce the side effects to normal tissues, but then it becomes um, very much a case by case basis, trying to convince those medical directors that for this specific patient's condition, this specific tumor and the specific patient treatment, that 
the comparison of proton versus photon is, is remarkably better. I do think when we, anytime we talk about the utilization of protons, with the, the issue of cost comes up. And so um, is proton therapy more expensive than traditional radiation? Absolutely, yes. But it, that's really only part of the question. So when we think about the total cost of care of cancer patients, oftentimes proton could be less expensive. And let me explain. So let's take a patient that has maybe a, 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 a tumor of the head and neck region, and they're getting combined chemotherapy, combined radiation therapy, and the side effects from that treatment may be pretty dramatic. And those patients may actually be hospitalized for part of their side effect management. Well, if we can take a technology like Proton, where albeit the technology itself may be more expensive, but minimize hospitalizations that result after their treatment, it actually um, is coming out. And there's some studies about it. UPenn did a large study um, and showed that the cost of care for proton therapy was actually less in that patient population in one of their clinical trials. So I think what we have to think about, maybe the modality itself is, could be more expensive, but the total cost of care for the, the cancer patient you know, could be less in some cases. That makes sense, thank you. We have a question in terms of lymphoma. Are there certain types of lymphoma that could be treated with this? And if so, does it need to be in, um, confined to a specific area? Yeah, and so full disclosure, I'm not a physician. Uh, I, I'm a therapist by clinical background. Um, and, and so I, I would just really feel, I think that would need to be deferred to one of our physicians. You know, radiation in general is a local treatment, so radiation is used in management of some patients with lymphoma, but I think it, it just gets into very specific about where it is. The one thing that, that we do struggle with proton therapy, and I think this is temporary, is um, it is such a specific treatment. It is so targeted and pinpointed that um, tumors that move a lot um, do create some unique challenges. So here's my example. I talked about the avocado. I talked about the avocado seed. Well, let's say that that tumor is in the lung. And as the patient has normal respiratory cycles, that tumor's moving around a lot. Um, that's a difficult challenge for a proton because we don't, we want to minimize the area outside of that tumor that gets irradiated. So there are techniques that the clinical team can put into place to, to limit the amount of motion of a tumor, but tumors that do move a lot are, are, a, are a challenge to us from a proton standpoint. Um, so there's, there's things that they, they do is have the patient hold their breath. Um, they put belts around the patient's abdomen and, and tighten your abdomen. Think about a belt around your stomach really, really tight. It limits your ability to take big breaths in and out. And for tumors, depending on where they are in the lung, have different amounts of motion that they make. If it's closer to the diaphragm, they move a lot more. If it's up towards the top of your lungs, they move a lot less with respiratory cycle. So there's just a lot of factors. Um, lymphoma would probably, um, we have, I know of at least one patient that was treated with, that had a lymphoma diagnosis. It was in their head and neck region. So Oftentimes, they're also looking, I, I've said before, it's not what you treat, it's about what you don't treat. So depending on where it's located makes a big difference in, um, in that side effect and if proton would be selected over traditional x-ray. So um, thank you for, for that in terms of the movable uh, tumor, but when we're looking at sometimes maybe an advanced stage cancer that's spread, does this machine make that more treatable um, or, or, or would that help with that? Um, because we know a lot of times it's not fully treatable when they're yeah. spread with traditional radiation. Yeah, so, um, um, you know, radiation in general, as I said, it's a local treatment. So patients with widespread metastatic disease uh, in multiple areas of their body, um, it's probably not going to offer a substantial benefit 
Um, and here, there's a lot of caveats around that. Um, but patients with extensive metastatic disease are probably going to be less inclined to get it. And, and you know, there's a, there's a, a, a clinical benefit. It's a limited resource. I mean, we treat, we have seven locations now that we provide radiation at. Um, we treat somewhere around 250 to 260 patients a day with radiation. And my capacity for proton is about 30 patients a day. Um, so there is, um, there is a, a, a little bit of a process to, to determine um, which patients would benefit most based upon their their type of treatment that they need to receive and the dose they need to receive to make sure that there's a selection of patients that most fits that. Um, so probably less common we would use it in, in, in uh, really extensive disease. Okay. You mentioned esophageal cancer is one of the ones that, that could benefit from proton therapy. What if um, somebody had been treated successfully for that, was in remission, and it came back? So maybe they have some radiation scarring. Um, would they possibly benefit from this? Yeah, so, um, you know, esophageal cancer is not a really common disease. And so the thing about esophageal cancer, you know, it would be great to have a whole bunch of randomized clinical trials that looked at conventional treatment versus proton treatment. Um, the thing about esophageal cancer is it's, it's, there's a lot of adjacency to critical structures. So if you think about um, esophageal cancer, you have the heart, you have the lungs, you have the, the bronchial tree, and right behind the esophagus, you have the spinal cord. And so, um, you know, that's one of the reasons I think, you know, esophageal cancer is one of, is a really important diagnosis um, to be treated. And sometimes with esophageal cancer, you have long tumors. Um, so they have to treat pretty extensively. But as far as retreatment, I, I think it just all depends. Um, so if a patient's already received a maximum dose, um, and can they come in with um, proton therapy for a smaller spot, that is one of the indications that we can typically get paid for. Um, because of the, uh, you know, the, the adjacency to heart and lungs and, and spinal cord that may have already received a maximum dose. We have a spe uh, question specific in terms of breast cancer radiation um, and the side effects, uh, which we know there are a lot of side effects from uh, long-term side effects from breast cancer radiation. So with the, with the more pencil thin and not treating areas that with radiation that shouldn't be treated, um, what is the prognosis? How, how, how much more effective could that be in terms of, of helping someone with breast cancer? Yeah, so uh, um, I'll take, I'm here again, not a physician. Um, for treatment of early stage breast cancer, I think one of the things that you know, the, the clinical team has learned over the years is especially patients with left-sided breast cancer um, and the adjacency to the heart and the lungs is really an important part. So um, what happens today with, with, with X-ray-based um, breast treatment over the last five or six years is very, very different than it was. I've been in this field for 30 plus years and I can think about the way we treated patients 30 years ago is very different. And so for left-sided breast cancers, almost all patients are treated with holding their breath. And when they hold their breath, what happens is, is that it, it separates the breast tissue from the heart. And so for left-sided breast cancer patients, even with conventional treatment, um, there's very, very little heart dose that go, that, that's treated. Um, there's still gonna be some lung tissue. So for early stage breast cancer, I can't imagine that proton therapy offers any significant benefit. But for some of the later stages or higher stages of breast cancer, where they have more nodal involvement um, or the need to treat more deep nodes, um, like the inframammary nodes, there, there could be um, some benefit. I think the answer is, is we don't know and clinical trials will be one of the key, um, um, is one of the key decision points or the key to understand um, what the significance of that will be. 
Um, we have not treated any breast cancer patients yet on our unit. Um, I, I know there's one patient and had a lot of uh, additional, was very young patient, had a lot of comorbidities that it was being considered, but I, I do think there was importance of having a clinical trial um, that will be available to us that, that our providers can enroll those patients on that study. Thank you. Um, I don't currently see any additional questions. Does anyone else have, have questions for, for Darren? I have a question, Kathy. This was really great. And Kathy and Education Committee, Peggy and everyone here, you did a great job pulling this together. And um, Darren, I have had tours and I continue every time, just get really interested in what you have to share with this. My question is just, you're, you've, um, you appear to have been in radiation oncology but for a while, if your beard's any... <laughs> <laughs> and he says, and Darren knows that I know him and I'm used to him being very clean cut. So this, I, I will attest, you look good either way, but you definitely look different than you typically do. My question for you is, um, you get connected to a lot of individuals with cancer and you hear about, about things in radiation therapy that are challenges, I things that that um, are, are great about the treatment. And as we are partnering with researchers, are there things that, that you think we should keep in mind that you periodically hear from patients about concerns? I have an example of one actually that I could give, but I'd love to hear what are some of the things that you're hearing from patients kind of as a collective experience in radiation therapy? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question, and I, I'd be love to think of talk about your your example. Um, the one trend that we see in radiation is shorter courses of treatment. So um, we think about, let's say, breast cancer. For most of my career, those patients received thirty five to thirty seven treatments, and today um, that would be I, I would say it's much more uncommon. Most patients are twenty treatments or less. And so when you think about the hardship of, of radiation therapy, it's that daily treatment. So um, um, I grew up in a town called Udall, Kansas, which is about 40 miles outside of Wichita. My dad had prostate cancer. And so when he was looking at his treatment options, thinking about driving 40 miles every single day for seven weeks of treatment was just, for him, it was just that was just, would have been a huge hardship. So it's, you know, it, the drive in time would be much longer. So I think when we think about Kansas is very much of a rural state, Missouri is very much of a rural state, and that we have large pockets of, of areas that they don't have close accessibility of, of a radiation center. And um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big KU flag wearer. And I think, you know, it, all centers, aren't the same. And so I think accessibility to radiation is, is a really, really important part of that. Um, I think there's, so giving patients a shorter treatment option, I think is, is really, really important from that standpoint. The cost is expensive, but when you compare it to like modern immunotherapy, I mean, radiation is a relative bargain from that standpoint. Um, radiation is typically the, the cost is per treatment. So the shorter treatments we can do, um, that re reduces that, that patient's um, overall treatment cost significantly. So there's just kind of a few things. Access, I think, is really, really important. You know, part of our, you know, the, the MCA partnership, when we think about, you know, I, I'm in Topeka every single Wednesday. And so, you know, I think about, you know, our ability to offer radiation clinical trials at our Topeka clinic, no different than we do at our Kansas City clinic. I think, you know, I'm certainly very, very proud of that because, uh, you know, clinical trials, I think, are, are so key to determining what the treatment will be tomorrow, not necessarily what it was yesterday. And hope I, you may have a specific example I can address. No, I think those were really good examples. And I think you're your transportation and travel is particularly 
um, sits with me when I think not just about the distance, but also the type of work people do. So if their cancer happens, if they're a farmer, when wheat needs to come in, the wheat's going to come in and the treatment's going to wait. So there's there's times like that. I also th um, recently had heard someone that was really surprised about the tattoo part and um, and ha wasn't prepared for that when they when they walked in for their appointment. So thinking about both just um, personally how that feels and also if there's any religious considerations related to that, just again, patient education and thinking about those might be things we could bring up as we hear from researchers in radiation oncology, but I'm sure everyone here has even better thoughts and Cheryl's got her hand up, so I'll be quiet. Well, um, and, and I, I know there's two more questions. There's one that came into the chat just before Cheryl's hand went up. So um, I wanna get to the chat. Um, it, it goes around um, the breathing and holding your breath. You mentioned the breathing and from the patient point of view, do pencil beams still require that holding the breath or do they vary the point of entrance? So it's not required anymore. Yeah, the holding the breath still happens because the value of holding the breath is, is that the tumor is moving as the patient breathes in and breathes out. And so if they hold their breath, um, what happens is, is the tumor stabilizes. And so not all patients would get that technique, but what they do is when they're doing that original, original planning in the simulation, they typically do a scan with the patient holding their breath and the patient free breathing, and then they measure the difference. And so if the tumor motion doesn't change between the two scans, there would be no benefit potentially. If the tumor stops moving or reduces their movement, then they would um, probably choose for, for that. And then the other part of it is just the physical part. Sometimes when you hold your breath, it's not about the tumor moving, it's about the different levels, how much air you have in your lungs may expand and change, move the, the target or the tumor further away from a normal structure. So uh, they do lots of different techniques to try to minimize tumor motion and, and give greater separation between a normal and an abnormal tissue. Thank you. Um, Cheryl, go ahead. You may have, I don't know if this really exists or not, Darren, but you may have answered, I, I know when you were talking uh, about the differences in dosing and is there a way to reduce the dose? And that's a controversy that we deal with in breast cancer. So I was wondering if um, there are other examples like that in proton therapy where the field is still trying to figure out or answer questions and appropriate dosing, can we lower that dosing, get the same impact for the patient in terms of the cancer, but minimize the side effects? Are there other different questions that are being explored through research or through at least thinking about research? Yeah, I think so. A lot of the, the dosing questions. So um, uh, I'm trying to to explain this the best way I can. So um, there's a certain amount of dose to kill a specific kind of tumor cell. And sometimes the effectiveness, it's not the total dose necessarily. Um, sometimes they can lower the dose, but give more per day. And so the normal cells have the ability to repair themselves. The cancer cells don't. And so sometimes giving a higher dose for a lower number of treatments has the same um, you know, tumor effect um, from that standpoint. So a lot, of the, a lot of the clinical trials, a lot of the answers that the scientists and physicians are trying to answer is, can we give a lower total dose, but more dose per day and get the same relative benefit? And I think we've certainly seen that in breast cancer. We're certainly seeing that in prostate cancer um, and then there's a, there's a whole area that we call stereotactic where patients um, get ultra high doses in their, a lot of, it could be in the brain or the lung, but they get less than five or less fractions and give a total dose. So I think one of the big areas is just giving, um, does a higher dose per day and a lower number of treatments give them the same benefit? And obviously if they can do that, then we think about the patient transportation you know, they can come up to the Hope Lodge and stay for a week and be done with their treatment. 
um, that's a big benefit comparing to getting a hotel and staying here for, for two to three months while they get the duration of their treatment. So as you were explaining that, what you made me think of is, so the question about dosing how, how, when, where, how much, how many times, that sort of thing, is the same probably across the board of different kinds of radiation treatments, including proton? Is yeah, I don't, I'm not aware of any study that shows that we can give this dose for proton and this dose for photon and that be significantly different. Um, I think, you know, that those are for the most part translatable. That's what I was wondering. Thank there, you. There are some really, I mean, it's over my head, but there are some um, <laughs> that the, the cell effect or the cell kill with radiation has a, what they call it a radiobiological effect may be higher with proton. And I don't think we really, you know, fully understand that where a one unit of radiation with proton versus one unit of radiation with, with photon could offer greater benefit. But I, I think we're, we're, we don't know the answer to that yet. So that one's still being investigated. Stay yeah. tuned, right? Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Darren. Okay, well, I, I, I wanna thank everyone. I wanna be mindful of people's time because I know a lot of folks tuned into this uh, over the lunchtime. Um, which is why we held it at noon. I want to thank Darren and all of you um, for joining in. This has been very helpful. Um, thank you so much for your for sharing this um, this knowledge with us, Darren. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, everyone. Um, uh, Tanya will be sending out an evaluation afterwards. So be sure to give us some feedback so we can make sure that we make these series better in the future. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you, everyone, for participating. And I've also included an evaluation in the chat for those of you that, that, that saw it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.